Now, Dr. Bara Zoheli is a medical doctor and a vascular surgeon, and he worked in Gaza in January as well as July, and he joins us from Flint, uh, Michigan. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bara, for uh, joining us. Um, can you tell us more about your reaction when you are hearing, having been to Gaza twice now and witnessed what you have, your reaction to what's happening, especially in the north? I think people, for better or worse, we focus on the numbers. We talk about all the people who died or injured. I would like people to pay attention to the layers and layers of misery that exist there beyond that. So forget, for, just for the sake of argument, forget about the injured and all the dead. Just imagine the lady, for example, and I'm going to give you an example of the lady who used to clean our room in the hospital in San Yunus. This lady used to be a teacher in, the, in, in, in one of Gaza schools. Well, at the beginning of the war, she lost her husband. She lost her home. She has been displaced at least seven times so far. Multiple, multiple of her kids were injured during the war. And now she's working as a cleaning lady for us. Now, she doesn't have access to personal hygiene. She doesn't have any access to something as basic as water. She has to stand every morning for two, three hours before coming to the hospital to clean our room just to get water, just to cook something for her kids, who, by the way, are injured. And now also she has to figure out ways to take care of her injured kids who are on the verge of death because she doesn't have food. So this is, this is the level of, of the layers of misery that we see over and over and over. And those are the numbers that we don't really talk about because we're just focused on the death and injury. But honestly, the levels of misery goes way beyond that. Mm. I mean, we see these images day in, day out, absolutely uh, horrific, traumatizing to those that are seeing it, let alone those that are, are living it. Can you talk us through uh, what a day looked like for you as a doctor in the Gaza Strip, in one of the worst humanitarian situations in modern history? So anytime we can literally hear the bombardment and we can see the smoke coming out of the bombardment place, but believe it or not, we couldn't get any of those injured in that bombardment for another sometimes five, sometimes to 12 hours after the injury, simply because the Israeli army wouldn't let any ambulance get close to that area. So very often, you would have someone who was injured, who lost his or her leg eight hours ago, and he or she, most of the time a kid under the age of eight, has been bleeding, has been trying to stop the bleeding for the last eight hours before someone could get to him or her to bring them to the hospital. So for us, anytime we hear a bombardment, we know that we're going to get an influx of mass casualties five to eight hours later. And by the time they come to us, most of them have already died. Most of them have already lost limbs. Most of them have already been suffering and literally bleeding for many hours before they get to us. And even when they get to us, it's not like they have reached heaven. We have to make a decision who's getting our attention because we only have very limited resources of who's getting the attention. So most of the time, we let some of them pass away in front of us. We let them literally scream to death. And then we get our attention to few of them that we can think that we can give them a chance of living. Doctor, it sounds like you are having to make decisions, some very incredibly difficult decisions over who lives and who dies. Absolutely. And, and, and trust me, for someone who swore his life to saving lives, that wasn't an easy decision. And what made it even more difficult, 80% of the time, those decisions were made for kids. And when I say kids, I don't say 14, 15 year old kid. I'm talking about someone who's as young as two months to three years old kid that we have to make a decision that, you know what, this kid, this two or three year old boy doesn't have much chance of living, even though he's screaming, he's bleeding, he's still alive in front of us. We just look at their parents and say, sorry, we cannot give them the attention. We have other things to attend to. And that kid will die in the next few minutes. Sorry, we cannot help you. And we just walk away. And doctor, this has been going on now for over a year. Just when you thought in the beginning of the war, it couldn't get any worse. It's just gotten worse and worse and worse. 
You've been there twice, um, I believe you said in January and then July. Did you see a difference? Because even since July, it seems the situation has gotten much worse. Significantly worse. So even something as basic as antibiotics, something as basic as God, didn't exist anymore. In the report that was just mentioned a few minutes ago, when he said he could smell the blood all over, that was the reality. Next, um, in Khan Yunus, in Nasser Hospital, anytime you walk to the emergency room, the smell of blood was unbearable simply because they don't even have soap. Just something as simple as soap or detergent didn't even exist in the hospital. So all the blood that has been rotten on the floor, you can smell it from, from a distance because they just don't have basic supplies to clean the blood from the floor. And uh, doctor, how did you cope? How do the medical staff cope under such horrific conditions? Um, it's obviously difficult for people in Gaza, but as someone that's been in and out, how are you coping even now? It, it wasn't easy, but honestly, what, what I get my strength is from the local people of Gaza. Literally every single doctor or nurse I worked with um, over there in Gaza, every single one of them has at least one potentially up to 10 family members who died recently. And they kept going and they kept pushing and they kept fighting for what they think is their duty to preserve yet another life. So for me, it was much easier to going through this because I didn't lose anyone. I didn't lose my house. I, di I didn't get displaced seven or eight times like most of them. So for me, anytime I felt the weakness, I felt I cannot keep going. I just took it at, at, at one of them and I immediately got my boost of confidence that we should keep going. Mm. Um, some horrific, obviously, scenes we've been seeing. I can't even imagine what it must have been uh, like for you, first-hand witness, Dr. Bara Zoheli, a medical doctor and a vascular surgeon who's twice been to the Gaza Strip since this uh, war started, since the genocide started in the Gaza Strip. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your personal account of your experience there. Thank you for having me. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get the latest news from Al Jazeera.